You just killed Kitava. Now what? Hi, it's Lerald, and I'm going to talk about early Atlas strategy and getting yourself set up for success in the end game as you push toward getting your first two Void Stones. But before I do, don't forget to like and subscribe. So depending on how quickly you've progressed through the campaign and how much time you spent along the way stopping and killing dudes, you may be anywhere from around level 60 to like 70, 72. You have to go Katava to actually start running maps. That is a requirement, but not for a lot of other low level non map league mechanics like Sanctum and Heist. So some early league strategies will actually wait to kill Katava until they've done one of those for a while so that they don't have to deal with the second minus 30 resistances debuff. I usually don't do this myself, but I am just pointing it out as an option. It is definitely something that some people will do. So tier one maps are zone level 68. And while that doesn't mean you need to be level 68 to do them, it is a decent rule of thumb to be around that range. So if you're in the low 60s, it's probably a good idea to get some XP outside of maps before even stepping into them. One of the best ways to get some very easy XP is to do some of the really efficient, like just good layout act nine zones. And there are two of them. Blood Aqueduct is kind of the community favorite, but Quarry is another good one as well. These are both good areas with lots of enemies to kill. They're both above item level 59 or area level 59. So all the rare items that drop in the area will be useful for chaos recipe. They'll be in that 60 to 74 range. Both of these are basically just like tier zero maps. They're they're good layouts, easy mobs you can run through here. I'm on a very, very bad character. Like I haven't even looked at my resistances. Shockingly, they're not all completely negative, uh, but I can just zoom through here very easily killing stuff, leveling up gems, getting XP for for both gems and my character and getting this character that I think I was 62 or 63 when I killed Katava the first time before doing it a couple more times for footage purposes. Um, I, I, you know, I, I could very easily get this character up to about 66 or so and then start doing maps. Another advantage of doing this and just being in here is you can get yourself a little bit better gear. You can get some gear that has like life and maybe one resistance or one stat on it and then craft another like useful stat onto it. Really from the moment you hit Act 9, you can start picking up rares to use for the Chaos Recipe. Now I would never go back to town to like dump my inventory the moment that I fill it up if I'm doing the Chaos Recipe, but I will take any rare items that I have picked up and are in the item level 60 to 74 range and just dump them into a stash tab instead of straight vendoring them. And I'll do that every time I head back to town. So I'll have an empty inventory so I can scoop back, uh, you know, a whole bag full of more items to, to use for the chaos recipe. Now doing the chaos recipe is not fun. I don't like it, but it will hand you a decent number of extra chaos in the early part of a league. And all you really have to do is pick up rares and then vendor a full like full armor set, you know, every single piece and either two one handed weapons or one two handed weapon. Quivers and shields aren't uh, a part of it, but other than that, it's just a full set of gear, right? And that gear all needs to be at least the lowest item level piece of it needs to be between 60 and 74. So all of it could be above 74, except for one piece and you'll still get a chaos. But if any of the pieces are below 60 item level, then you'll get a chance or you, you don't want to mess with that. The thing with chaos recipe, even though it's annoying and really only worth doing for like the first handful of hours or maybe first day of, of a league is it can be the difference between having the chaos to afford an important unique item like a quill rain of several hours earlier on into a league. And that's good. That can save you a bunch of time that you might otherwise have to spend like farming out heist for a little while to get some chaos, get some currency that way. So it definitely is just a way to be a little bit more efficient with, I mean, really just the first day of a league. All right. So when should you stop and run heist instead of doing maps? I would say that this is kind of a feel thing. Uh, rather than like a hard answer. As I said earlier, I think a lot of people will just do it before they even kill Kitava and start mapping or have finished the campaign. They will just do heist for a while at very low level to build up a baseline of some currency and rare gear with a bit of life and resistances. They'll just use the contracts that they find during the campaign, like just pick up off the ground and maybe they'll buy all these level 65 ones from Wakano. 
I think those go up to 67 or something. But yeah, anyways, they'll buy these cheapos from Wakano for like chance orbs, run all of those and do that as a way to just get like a very small baseline of, of bubblegum currency. And that, that is a pretty good safe approach. It's also uh, a good way to build up, you know, more rare gear as well. Just a little bit of gear with like life resistances and stats really goes a long way toward making those first few hours of mapping a lot safer and smoother. You could also just double back to doing heists if you feel like you've stalled out at any point in the mapping process. And that's usually the approach that I will take is I will map just, you know, as as quickly and efficiently as I can. And if I feel like I hit a point where I've like run out of Alex or Vols to use on my maps or whatever, uh, then I'll double back to heist. Maybe I just get a little bored of mapping for some reason. I don't know. It's a really easy way to make some cheap currency, though, doing heist early on. And then you can use that to upgrade some of your gear and get your Atlas progression rolling, either like from the start or if you have stalled out, you can kind of kickstart it back into going again. Now, once you're at a level where you feel like you're safe, ready to step into maps, that could be as soon as you kill Kitava. Maybe it's after you've leveled up to like 68 and Blug Aqueducts or Quarry. Either way is fine. But once you've hit that point, you should take Curex Tier 1 map and get right into it. The main goal is just to have like some level of life and resistance on your gear so that you can basically go into a map and fight two rare mobs at once and not instantly die. You can also, I mean, you should definitely be sure to use the crafting bench. Like, I'm sure I have some pieces on this character that I haven't really looked at that maybe have like room for a suffix or I mean, OK, it looks like I don't. Wow, I really did do a good job with that in the, in the leveling process. But I mean, look at this. Look at this quiver, right? It has life and one resistance. I could probably farm around for like a better quiver where I could get multiple resistances on it. Certainly this blue bow isn't exactly doing me any favors from this point. What you want to do is progress the Atlas as quickly as you can constantly doing the highest tier map you have available and just moving through the end game quest line into higher and higher tier maps consistently. The main goal in every map is really just to try and find at least one map of a higher tier and kill the map boss so that you get Atlas progression and an Atlas tree point. For white tier maps, you need the map to be magic, so slap it with uh, transmutation. That's all you have to do. For yellow tier maps, you need the map to be rare, so you would want to hit those with an Alk, of course. And for red tier maps, for lower red tier maps, I'm usually not using like chisels until I either have a good supply of them built up or until I'm like doing in game strategies. So for red tier maps, they need to be rare and and corrupted. And so I would basically just hit them with a with an Alc orb and then hit them with a Vol orb. And if they turn into an even higher tier, that's actually a bonus. That's a good thing. So that's great. This right here, having Vol Orbs and, and Alks ready to go when you get up into the yellow and red tier maps is where that bit of time spent heisting early on can keep you from stalling out due to like lack of currency later. If you do stall out on maps a bit, like you actually, let's say I ran this T13 map and instead of getting a T14 or even another T13, I had nothing and I tumbled back down to like 12 or 11. What you want to do in that situation is just keep running the highest tier maps you have available to keep generating more maps and basically climbing back up the ladder. If you have maps at the highest possible tier that you haven't completed yet, doing those is really good because it will grant you more Atlas passives, and those do help with map sustain and just general Atlas progression. So on that note, let's move over to how we want to set up our passive tree initially so that we can consistently generate maps of higher tiers and progress into higher tier maps and pursue the Eater and the Exarch and get our first two Void Stones. So just starting from nothing, I like I have a tree that I, I kind of path my way towards here, but I'll sort of show the general progression. First couple of points, I want to go right up the gut here. And I like to take covert stakeouts along the way, this node that increases the chance of finding Jun and getting master missions from Jun, because I really like Jun at the very start of a league. I just think she's really really great she gives you so much good gear the the veiled gear is so valuable kind of allows a little bit of control over the stats on your gear and also they're just the veiled stats are really really powerful so it's good to have jun available that's kind of all the investment we do on her at this point we're really just focused on getting maps so we like to come up further and i don't really love expert reconnaissance like scouting reports or whatever but kirak is really valuable so i like to take commissioned officer 
and all of these Kirak mission completion chance nodes along the way come right through here and and get that right off the bat. So you're giving yourself a massive increase to your Kirak mission chance uh, as well, which is really good. OK, once we've gotten set up with Kirak and commission officer and all that, I like to take shaping the mountains and shaping the skies. The main point of these wheels is that you're getting the chance to find higher tier maps, which is just really good for that initial push into map progression. These little nodes here also, the maps being a 5% chance to be found one tier higher. These are all really, really good little nodes to pick up along the way. Now, also a lot of these little small nodes here, 2% chance for one monster in each of your maps to drop an additional connected map. That's very valuable for early map sustain and map progression and then the same goes for all these half a percent chance for map drops to be duplicated these are really good so once we've gotten set up like this our goal here is to go up to wandering path we really don't want to go through seventh gate because that is kind of a wasted point it gets us there a little faster i mean like going this direction is also fine the point is that you want to come up to wandering path and then you basically want to drop all of these notable nodes that you've taken, these notable points like Commissioned Officer and Shaping the Skies and Shaping the Mountains and unfortunately Covert Stakeouts. And what you're going to do at this point, if we expand our tree panel here, you see this number here, 52% chance for a monster in each of your maps to drop an additional connected map. This really helps with, with climbing the ladder and getting higher level progression and being able to double that because that, as if you can kind of see, there's sort of a meridian line here, right, running left and right across the Atlas Passive tree. As soon as you get above this node and you come up to map drops have a chance to be duplicated, uh, all of the small passives that are just like travel nodes are like duplication chance until you reach the very like top hat where it then becomes map mod effect, which is not as useful for early map progression. So what you want to do is you want to take as many of these adjacent map drop chance nodes as required to get this number up to 100%. And that is literally just what we're going to do with with a, the rest of our maps until we've hit 100 on that. We don't need to go over 100, just 100% chance to get a, a guaranteed additional connected map in every single one of our maps. It really, really helps with continuing to push upward into higher level maps and also this doubles these little nodes that give us uh, a chance for our maps to be one tier higher so we're also guaranteeing that all of our maps are one tier higher and we're guaranteeing that we get a connected map in every map once we have all of these points in it'll take about 50 points so it'll take a little while to get all of these points but it basically becomes impossible almost impossible for us to uh hit a stall point where like we do a t13 map no T14 or 13 map drops and we tumble all the way back down to like T10 or whatever that basically becomes impossible once we have all of these points. And that is like my early map sustain tree. I will link that in the description. It looks uh, just a little bit more advanced than the one I had just clicked out. As you can see, I take some Jun nodes, just more betrayal mission chance and some more betrayal mission chance here. And that basically compensates for not being able to take uh, covert stakeouts. Now we won't stay in this wandering path tree forever. I basically just like to do this until I've gotten the two void stones. And then once I've done that, I usually will then start thinking about trying to transition out of this into something like one of the two strategies that I've talked about most recently, essence or bestiary or both, or, you know, since we are kind of already on the right hand side of the tree, maybe transition into more of like a Jun style uh, tree setup where we're taking a lot of these gen nodes and we're dropping wandering path. But you want to do this initially just to get yourself like a nice stockpile of maps, get built all the way up the tree and kind of just get things established and then especially get those two, uh, I think I called them watch stones a couple of times, void stones. Get those two void stones, that's really important. Kirak is another great mechanism for sustaining your maps and I definitely want to talk about him now. So let's just get right into him. Kirak is two things. He is a combination of a, a mission handout guy, which his missions, if we look at one of these missions here, they're basically just run this map for me. You'll have to do something in the map. Some of these can be like do a harvest in low tier maps. That's OK. Some of them will be more like uh, open a smuggler's cache, get some free heist stuff. And that's that's actually pretty good at league start. Uh, sometimes you will get one that's find a stack of divination cards. Now, this is something that people have kind of gamed around where like if there's a map where there's a particularly valuable divination card, you can 
intentionally not complete that map and then do the find the stack of divination cards Kirak mission in the hopes of getting like, you know, you do do that in Crimson Temple and hope that you get a full mage blood's worth of cards. I've seen people play around with it. It doesn't really seem like a great strategy, more like a gimmick, but, you know, something to post about Reddit on. For me, I basically just use the Kirak missions. You know, you hit alt and see, like, have you completed? Of course, I'm I'm not an SSF on this character now, so obviously I've completed everything, but I usually will just use Kirak to help complete the Atlas. A strong thing about Kirak, though, is he has this whole page full of maps that are available to purchase, and they will be based off of like what tier of maps you've done, what tier of map uh, missions you've done with him. And so you can buy like some of these maps. I'll buy all of his yellow tier maps just to show off here. So if I were to launch a mission, you don't actually have to run it or jump into the map at all. Just launch the mission from him, open it up, and now he has refreshed his page. So he will sell you maps. They're usually more expensive. It depends than uh, than buying them from other players. But the advantage is you don't have to trade with anybody else. And at the very, very lowest level, the very start of a league, it actually is cheaper. Like, you know, he sells them for wisdoms, wisdom scrolls and chance orbs. Like, that's pretty cheap. Yellow maps are like a couple alks and a couple of chances. Again, very cheap. It's only when you start getting into the high tier maps where it might be like 10, 20 chaos for a tier 16 map or something that's a little less valuable. He also will sometimes sell div cards that will give you things like maps or potentially like shaper or elder guardian maps and those can sometimes be like a couple of like a couple of cartographers chisels or a couple of chaos orbs or chance orbs or something like very very efficient div cards from kirak from time to time and that is really really good for your early map sustain and that is why we like to put those points into Kirak early on as we're progressing up here before we have come up to Wandering Path. Just taking, even though Expert Reconnaissance isn't really all that great, the um, I don't think I have many of them on me, but he'll have all different kinds of scouting reports and you can use those to re-roll his map mission options in in the off chance that you've done all of the maps that he's offering, being able to re-roll them and, and hopefully get one or I guess Pretty much it's deterministic. He will give you one that you haven't completed already. So that is a good way to kind of fill out some of your Atlas progression. All right. So I think the final question I have here that I want to kind of answer is when should you transition out of this specific tree, this like map farming setup and into more of an end game tree? And I think the answer really is that once you've killed Eater and Exarch and you've gotten those two void stones and you put them in, that gives you a 50% chance for all of your maps to be a tier higher. And that kind of invalidates a lot of the need to specifically push for like 100% chance for all of the monsters or one of the monsters in your map to drop a connected map for you to have 100% chance for all of your maps to be a tier higher from your Atlas tree. And so like this real, this setup is basically got a very short shelf life. You you run this specifically to climb the ladder and kill those two in game bosses and get those void stones. And then once that's done, you're pretty safe just like farming up as many uh, orbs of unmaking as you can. I kind of have an addiction to eating these things like crazy, especially at the start of a league. But that is basically it. You you finish that specific objective of killing those two bosses and then whether it's through heist or through trading with other people or whatever method you want to do, uh, you get yourself a stack of orbs of unmaking, basically, and you take that and then all of the respect points that you've gotten from quests and you use those to kind of pull out of most of this tree and then transition into whatever sort of early in-game farming strategy you want to go with. For me, that'll probably be stuff that's more on the left-hand side of the tree. So like just to give an example, I probably will still be coming up the middle here, taking like prolific essence, and I probably will be playing around with stuff like Smuggler's Cash, you know, basically the combination of uh, Heist, Essence, and Beast is probably the approach I'm going to be going for. So this is just sort of me like playing around here, but like very basic stuff would be a lot of Heist nodes, a lot of Beast nodes, something along these lines. Yeah, I think something along this this sort of a setup here. Definitely, this is not like a hard and fast setup. It's not the only approach you can take. This is just 
something like this is probably the approach I would go with. And it is really nice that uh, quality of life that GGG is adding in the coming patch where you can have both like Jun and Einhar in the same map. Being able to do Beast and Betrayal at the same time is very appealing. I do like a, an early strategy where instead of kind of going over here to the left side and doing this like low level farming strategy of Essence and Beast together, you could just like full commit to Jun and just take basically all of the Jun nodes and do all of that. That's sort of a more old school approach for very early on in a league, but now you can kind of combine both. You can do Jun and, and Einhar at the same time. That's pretty cool. All right, I think that pretty much covers it. Again, the main goal here was really just to talk about like how to get your maps and your atlas set up so that you're able to sustain through. And I, I think we covered that and maybe even went a little further with uh, some early in-game strategy. Have fun progressing your atlas at uh, the new league start. Thanks for watching. Bye.